This is an L-shaped countertop we built some time ago. And this is an L-shaped desk we built some time after that. Do you see the difference in how the L's are joined together? The countertops are joined with a 45 degree miter joint, but the desk is connected with a 90 degree butt joint, which still makes me giggle a little bit when I say it. Now, why did I choose one type of joint over the other? It wasn't just a matter of personal appearance. There are a lot of factors that went into that decision. Factors you need to know about because choosing the wrong way to join two slabs together can lead to disaster down the road, and we don't want that. So today I'm gonna to help you figure it all out and give you some important tips that will really help when you build your project. Let's start with the pros and cons of each version of the joint. Personal preference is, of course, a major factor. Both can make attractive joints, but you may just like one more than the other. Take a closer look though, because there's more going on here than you may have considered. In my case, the desktop featured a square edge, while the countertop featured a profiled edge. This was a major factor in how they were joined. If you try to butt two profiled pieces together, you'll have a gap at the inner corner. This problem may be solved by routing edge profiles after the main slabs are connected. But since a round router bit cannot cut fully into a square corner, you'll either have to settle for a radius in the edge profile or you'll have to hand carve the transition to a point. Another solution may have been to just add moldings after the main slabs were joined. Then you could cope the inside corner as you might baseboards or crown moldings. But if you choose to connect the two panels with a large miter, you can route the profile first and not worry about it. You'll get a clean, crisp corner, just like a giant picture frame. So in my opinion, if you have a profiled edge, a miter joint may be better than a butt joint. But that's not the only thing to consider. Wood movement is also an important factor. I'm gonna tell you about that and give you some tips for cutting your joint in about 60 seconds, but first, you gotta see this. Many times in the past, I've needed a small pocket hole jig that can fit in a tight space to add a part or to make a repair. And I've come to realize that the Milescraft Pocket Jig 200 is the best value, and it comes with some really useful features that a lot of other mini jigs don't have. You can hook it on the edge of your workpiece to position it precisely. Then I push the button on top to set the jig to match that thickness on either the metric or imperial scales. Finally, on the underside, I have a convenient way to set the stop collar on my drill bit. The rare earth magnet on top conveniently sticks this right to the clamp. I love how they give you a quick release adapter in the kit so you can quickly switch between drilling and driving screws. And they even provide both short and long torque style drivers. Honestly, this set is such a good value for a lot less than I'd expect to pay. Like all the other Milescraft tools I own, it just does its job well at a reasonable cost. If you're looking for a simple, inexpensive pocket hole jig to build entire projects, or you just want a small version to complement your larger setup, this might be the one to get. Even after a finish is applied, wood swells and contracts as the humidity in the air changes. Boards do not grow longer with the grain. They only grow wider across the grain. So on humid days, the width of a large slab, such as a countertop or a desktop, can fluctuate by as much as an eighth of an inch. And this movement affects miter joints differently than butt joints. A butt joint features conflicting grain direction with end grain butting up to long grain you can't permanently tie these two panels together because while one side may grow wider, the other side won't be able to get longer to move with it. So if the seam between them is glued together, the end grain half of the joint will eventually crack. A miter joint is different. While the grain still runs in different directions, only the ends of the fibers are connected. Theoretically, both halves of the end grain to end grain joint should be able to grow and shrink together. But that's not what really happens. As the two halves of a miter joint swell wider, the outer corner tries to open up. Likewise, as the two slabs shrink narrower, the inner corners try to open up. This phenomenon is much more subtle than these drawings illustrate. You won't even notice it in a small picture frame, for example. But wide slabs contain many more fibers and the effect is magnified. As long as the project remains in a climate-controlled house, only very fine gaps are likely to open up. But all that wood movement is eventually going to compromise any glue that you may plan on using to hold those two panels together. 
So when it comes to the potential for wood movement, I do think both types of joints have their own sets of pros and cons, but you're going to have to deal with some of those things through the way that you hold them together. In fact, joinery is perhaps the most important factor to consider. But first, we should discuss actually cutting the joints. This can be an intimidating process because slabs are very likely large and unwieldy and the last thing you want are gaps in your joint. We cut one of these with a track saw and the other with a circular saw and an edge guide. The track saw was easier, especially for the angled cuts, but both did the job and you can get by with whatever you have. It's important though to make the entire cut in a single fluid motion if you can. Try not to pause mid-cut or you're likely to leave a blade mark that might then appear as a gap in the finished joint. If you aren't able to get a perfect seam with your circular saw, consider using a router and a straight edge to just skim the edge with a straight bit. This will clean up any blade marks and ensure a tight fitting seam. One thing to keep in mind is you shouldn't assume that your cut has to be a perfect 90 degrees or 45 degrees for a miter. In the countertop project, we made a template for the cabinets at the actual job site and then used it to mark the inner and outer corners of the joint so we could get the proper angle. On the desktop, we placed the two halves on the frame and scribed the end of the panel that was to be trimmed right to the edge of the mating panel. This prevents errors that you have, may have made in the frame or in the cabinet installation or the walls around cabinets that may compound into the tops as well. Now let's talk joinery. We already discussed the necessity of allowing for wood movement and how glue has no place in either of these joints. What we need is something to pull the two halves together and to keep them on the same plane up and down so the joint remains tight but the surface is flat and even. This is a good place for some type of loose tenon joinery. Biscuits will work just fine as long as you have a good cutter that creates a tight pocket for the biscuits to fit into. If the biscuit will wobble inside the pocket, it'll be useless for surface alignment purposes. A loose tenon router jig will work well. We made a video sometime back about loose tenon joinery. I'll link to it below. This is essentially the same type of joint that you would get with the popular Festool Domino. Remember, these loose tenons and biscuits are for alignment purposes. They keep the seam even so the countertop remains flat, but they must also allow the two halves of the joint to move side by side so they can expand and contract independently of each other. This is why biscuits or other loose tenons are preferable to something like dowels, because the slots may be cut wider than the biscuits or the tenons inside them, and that gives them room to move in that side to side direction while keeping it firm up and down. And they're dry assembled without glue. In fact, no glue at all is used in either the miter joint or the butt joint. Instead, they'll be held together with metal fasteners which allow for wood movement. For the butt joint, we chose pocket screws. Pockets are bored into the end grain of the joint, not the long grain. Then the exit holes are counter bored, as you see here, to make the hole larger than the screw's threads. When this joint is screwed together, the heads of the screws will pull it tight, closing the seam. If over time, as the end grain half of the joint becomes wider or narrower, the shafts of the screws can move within those enlarged holes and that'll let the panel move naturally without restriction. This movement is still possible even though the head of the screw is tightly driven to close that joint seam. The miter joint may also be joined with pocket screws, but I think the bond wouldn't be as strong because screw threads don't bite into end grain, which you have on both sides of a miter joint, as securely as they would with long grain, as we had on one side of the butt joint. I'm not saying you can't use pocket screws. I'm just saying it won't be as secure. And remember, a miter joint is unique in that it's trying to open up as the wood moves, so you want it to be tight. So in this case, we use what are called draw bolt joint connectors or dog bone connectors. These require a special slot that's easily created with a Forstner bit and a simple router jig. I'll link to another video below that we made that shows this installation process in a little more detail. I like these connectors because they are very, very strong. This thick slab countertop will never come apart and we can move it around during the installation without worrying about breaking it. Both joints, in fact, are very strong because we took the time to understand the unique nature of each type of joint. And now that you have that understanding too, 
you can be confident when you have a large corner to connect. See you next time.